So we've not seen that quantum computers can in principle compute quantum kernels. We've seen a couple of examples of how actually data encoding circuits can be interpreted as a feature map and so give rise to kernels. And obviously as many things in machine learning and also in quantum machine learning, this is only half, half of the work or maybe even 10% of the work to have this idea. But the big question is now, what are actually interesting kernels? And this is a very open research program and the answer to this is like by far there yet. Um, but what is important is we have to think of two things here. Interesting kernels have to fulfill the property that they are analyzing, helping us to analyze a data set or to do pattern recognition in some specific data set very nicely, possibly better than like classical methods. And secondly, it would be very interesting if the kernel is in some way um, computable on a quantum computer to some advantage. So, for example, there could be an exponential speed up on the quantum computer in that the quantum kernel is intractably to do classically. So in this case, you really need a quantum computer. However, in like this like area of near-term devices, it might also be already interesting if there's a constant speed up. For example, if the kernel is actually computed, like we saw with the squeezing kernel, if it could be computed with the speed of light, then we could have this little AI accelerator, which is my quantum computer, which just spits out kernel, kernels really, really fast. Um, so now, in the effort of like understanding what are good kernels, I want to like give you one more idea, which is extending the idea of quantum kernels by the idea of variational circuits. Um, most of you will know or probably have heard about variational circuits before. The idea is to make a quantum co uh, computer or a quantum algorithm depend on parameters. And this parameterized quantum circuit can now be like trained or optimized in order to fulfill a certain goal. And uh, in terms of quantum kernels, there are actually like two routes that we can go and I just want to like um, basically quickly introduce them and then leave it to you to like develop interesting quantum kernels in the future. Um, the one idea is actually um, not so much related to the kernel but to what comes after. We had before like the idea that the quantum kernel is computed on a quantum computer and then as classical information fed into a classical machine learning method. But we could actually also do the data analysis in feature Hilbert space because we have quantum algorithms that can analyze data. So in other words we can use the quantum computer to embed the data and to analyze the data. And this is what the slide's supposed to like um, show you, also like giving you just a little example. Um, we could now like use the state preparation routine that encodes X into the quantum state here. So at this sta stage, our quantum state of, of this whole register will be actually the quantum feature state. And now instead of like doing this with another part of the subsystem and computing inner products, we can actually um, use a variational circuit as a classifier. Which means the circuit here or this quantum algorithm depends on some parameters theta and I can train the parameters theta to give us good results. So if we now have like the state preparation routine and now we have kind of the classifier routine that's learnable, how do we get a prediction out of our quantum computer? There's lots of uh, ways to do this but like one very prominent example is I simply measure one qubit. So I measure the computational basis state of that qubit, is it in zero or one? And then I take like basically the expectation of the sigma z operator. So this is like basically the expectation if it's in zero or one, um, and use this to be to interpret this as the prediction of my quantum classifier. So what you see here is actually like in principle a complete quantum classifier on the quantum computer using the ideas of feature embeddings. So besides like doing the data analysis in feature Hilbert space but having a stiff basically kernel method that's hand coded by whatever choice you have here, you have probably already guessed that we can also just learn the kernel. What this means is totally unexplored and it's like up to you and, and all of us to like uh, explore like if this is actually a very good idea. But on paper the idea reads as follows, we just like instead of having just a the state preparation routine SX, which is hard-coded, we make it also depend on a couple of parameters. This could mean, for example, that I encode my first feature with an RX rotation and then encode, have a free parameter with another RX rotation and learn that parameter in order to maybe like um, learn a certain feature map in this framework. Okay, lastly, I want to give you um, or introduce you to another idea of like 
kernels and quantum computing that is not necessarily related to the quantum kernels as we defined them in the past sections, but they could be very interesting for future quantum machine learning algorithms. And the idea is basically from uh, the Riemann, Trosmosini and Lloyd paper from like 2014 of the quantum support vector machines. And um, this will be a little bit more advanced, so if you're not very used to the notation of density matrices and tracing out, uh, maybe skip this section, so I give you just the, the general idea now. Um, the idea is that if we encode um, data states into quantum systems in a certain way, so entangled basically with an index register, what that is I will explain it just now, we actually automatically get a density matrix that describes our quantum system that is entry-wise equivalent to the kernel matrix. So what does that mean? If I use just a certain state preparation routine to encode my data set into a quantum state, and we look at the density matrix of that quantum system, we have the kernel ground matrix. And this is very interesting because um, there are lots of tricks that show or have been shown that if we have a quantum system that represents this kernel ground matrix, we can do all sorts of linear algebra on this kernel ground matrix. For example, we can identify eigenvalues, do certain types of sampling, and very importantly, we can invert that matrix. Now, there has been a lot of controversial discussions if this matrix inversion, um, this is basically like very much based on a quantum principle component analysis. Some of you might have heard, heard about this trick. There's a lot of controversial debate if this is exponentially faster than doing it with a classical computer. And at the moment it looks like it's not. But um, we don't even need something that's exponentially faster. In this context, it's actually quite interesting if we just can do things quadratically faster because inverting a kernel matrix is usually like a little bit better than like quadratic in quadratic runtime. So now if the quantum computer can do it in linear runtime, this is already a lot won. So now to the equations, and it's only like three or four lines, but it gets a little bit messy. The day is the following. This one you know from the earlier lectures. This one is just um, our quantum feature state, which has been like prepared by encoding like the mth input into a quantum system. But now, before we have done it before once conditioned on an ancilla, but now we do it conditioned on a whole index register. So this can be a, a register of a couple of qubits. Um, and what it basically does is this index register marks that we actually loaded the mth input state here into the quantum feature state. What happens here, so once we have done this loading routine, which is not very trivial, so like you have to like decompose it into like gates and just see that it, it gets a little bit complicated to do this always like um, um, uh, conditioned on like your index state. But however, once we have this, we're actually already done. I'll show you why. Look at what the density matrix of this state is. To compute the density matrix, we basically have to get the outer product of these Dirac states. So this is just me writing this state here as a density matrix. And now the magic happens if we trace out this subsystem. Let me, to make it very clear, like mark this with an I. So by tracing out this subsystem, which we can write like this, we actually get a state that looks as follows. Check the right here, yes. So we get a state that, or we get a density matrix whose entry m m prime is weighted by exactly the value that's the inner product of these two feature vectors, which is nothing else than our kernel. So let's call this sigma. So basically, sigma is a density matrix whose entry m m dash is exactly our kernel. And what this kernel is depends on our state preparation routine that we applied. 
And now, once we have the state like encoded into our quantum system, we can now do all sorts of shenanigans. And um, this is another topic that is like the basis of like further research and um, leads a little bit more. We probably need a slightly bigger quantum computers to use this trick. But this is a very interesting like idea that I also wanted to share with you. Research into quantum kernels has actually just begun, and what you heard here is not a lecture on like concepts that have been like developed over the years and have been steadfast, but it is really a work in progress. And there are a lot of questions that still have to be answered, and they have to be answered with maybe numerical simulations, with uh, the first experiments on the quantum devices that we have available. Um, and the big question um, at the center is actually, are there data sets where quantum computers give us some advantage in computing kernels? Are there some data sets where mapping them with quantum circuits into the Hilbert space of a quantum system can be interesting and reveal patterns in the data and lead to very interesting classifiers or to other like machine learning models? Lastly, a very interesting question would also be if there are kernels that quantum computers can compute but classical computers can't. So are they intractable but still interesting kernels? And with that, I'm saying goodbye from Durban and have fun with the rest of the course. <laughs>